Uh, tonight's topic is a bit of a departure from the usual uh, think tank fair. So those of you who are here to, f to find out how we're going to pay for health care reform or to get, you know, to download a six-point plan for winning the war in Afghanistan, uh, I'm sorry, you're going to be a little bit disappointed. Um, but, uh, you know, as an institution, New America decided to start focusing more on God uh, when the Dow Jones Industrial Average hit 10,000. <laughs> The, the second time on the way down. Um, so suddenly we, we became less secular around here. And you know in the hallways, sometimes now you can hear people invoking God and saying little prayers um, as we've become more concerned about the, uh, the well-being of our funders and, and their endowments. Um, so I just wanted to say, well, first of all, my name is Andres Martinez. For those of you who don't know me, I'm the director of the Schwartz Fellows Program here. Uh, New America, as, as many of you know, is, is organized uh, around policy programs, much like other think tanks in town. We have an American Strategies program, which is the foreign policy shop, and health care program, and education program, um, fiscal policy, tech regulation. And our, 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 your host tonight, and my bailiwick here at New America, is the Bernard Schwartz Fellows Program, which is a bit different in that it supports the work of individuals. Um, and and they, they are doing their own research, and it's not necessarily part of any kind of larger New America agenda. What we strive to find are, are individuals who are doing uh, innovative uh, work and who are going to inform and influence uh, public policy debates with, with new, fresh thinking. And, uh, you know, Bob Wright, who's long been affiliated with New America, is is kind of a walking advertisement for what we what we strive to achieve here in terms of uh, the breadth of his thinking and the independence of his thinking, um, you know, we, we he's sort of the gold standard. Uh, Bob alone could be a, a fellows program unto himself, given the range of topics that he has tackled over the years, and and such books as uh, uh, Non Zero and Moral Animal, and, and now he's he's tackling God. Um, so this is very exciting, and we're also fortunate to have tonight. Um, David Plotz, who is the editor of Slate Magazine. Um, and David has also, David is famous for blogging the Bible and, uh, and writing about it on Slate. And that led to the publication of his own book, uh, The Good Book. And uh, I'm going to have to look up the subtitle for the book. So I can do it. It's long. It's, it's long. long. Good book, The Bizarre, Hilarious, Disturbing, Marvelous, and Inspiring Things I lear Learned When I Read Every Single Word of the Bible. And I really enjoyed your, your appearance on Colbert to discuss that. But anyways, uh, David is going to guide our discussion tonight. And hopefully, there will, I'm sure there will be a spirited uh, discussion between uh, these two. Uh, but just, just to start us off, um, Bob's going to first talk a little bit about what led him to write this book. And, and then David will take over and, and guide the conversation. And please linger afterwards and, and have some drinks. And let's, let's all get to know each other. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Andres, and, yes. and, and, and thanks to all of you for coming, um, and thanks to David for agreeing to uh, do this. Um, Only under the influence of alcohol. Of alcohol. If, if David says anything critical about my book, you should know that we have a very competitive relationship now that we've both <laughs> written God-related books. Um, the, uh, no, David's, da uh, David's book is a uh, good book, actually is a Great book. In fact, I thought the title should have been Great Book instead of Good Book. Uh, but uh, I, I recommend it. Um, and it, it covers the waterfront. Um, so uh, my book, uh, as the title suggests, uh, The Evolution of God, is about God. Um, it, it covers our changing conception of God since prehistory, really. But most of it is focused on the Abrahamic God, the God of Christians, Muslims, and Jews. Um, I, uh, and I should say, as long as I'm in Washington, uh, it's to a considerable extent about the, the political and economic underpinnings of changing conceptions of God, because I do put a lot of emphasis on how kind of uh, facts on the ground have changed the way we think about God over time. Um, I follow God through key thresholds in Abrahamic history, the emergence of monotheism in ancient Israel. Uh, the emergence of Christianity and the emergence of Islam. Um, and I like to think it's a 
pretty three-dimensional portrait, but there is one dimension that I focus on in particular that I, that I want to focus on here just briefly, which is kind of trying to account for God's changing moods. The, the, in, in all three um, tri Abrahamic traditions, uh, you see that sometimes God seems to be very nice and sometimes not so nice. So in the Quran, uh, sometimes uh, go uh, God, speaking through Muhammad, uh, is advising Muslims to uh, say to unbelievers, hey, you've got your religion, we've got ours, we can get along. And at other times, God is advising Muslims to kill the unbelievers. Um, in the Bible, uh, sometimes God is saying to the Israelites, um, you should annihilate any nearby peoples who worship the wrong gods. Uh, at other times, the uh, Israelites approach a nearby people who definitely worship the wrong god and say, uh, not, not only suggest peaceful coexistence, but actually invoke the alien god to validate that coexistence. They say, you've got your god, Chemosh, we've got our god, Yahweh, he gave us our land, your god gave you your land, can't we get along? So I was interested in um, trying to account for these mood fluctuations uh, to, to kind of figure out what circumstances bring out the best and the worst in a religion, and I was... Uh, uh, in, in concrete terms, I guess the question was, um, what circumstances prevailed at the time a given belligerent or tolerant scripture was written that inclined the author to interpret God's will as either belligerent or tolerant? Um, and the idea was that if you can figure out what, what circumstances uh, brought out the, the best and the worst in God, in the ancient world, maybe that would tell you something about the circumstances that could do that in the modern world. Because it would be nice, if, of course, if the three Abrahamic religions uh, got along and had, had a very tolerant attitude toward one another. Um, and I'll, I'll say just briefly what I think the basic dynamic is, what, what accounts for these shifting moods. But first, let me say that I do, I, I do emphasize that it is the circumstances, in my view, I don't believe that any religion has a, an eternal uh, character of any kind. I don't think uh, it, it makes sense to say, is Islam or any other religion a religion of peace? I don't think the answer is yes or no. I just don't think the question makes sense because all religions have shown they're capable of being religions of peace and all have, been, uh, have shown they're capable of being religions of war. Um, and, uh, you know, as a result of these changing moods of God during the formative periods of these religions, all scriptures feature a menu of options that believers can emphasize, ranging from the belligerent to the tolerant. And the question is, what circumstances in the modern world um, bring those out? And to just put it very simply, uh, I argue that... Um, when a group of people, a religi religious people, sees another group of people as, uh, as somebody that they can do business with, that they can constructively collaborate with, or they can at least benefit through peaceful coexistence with, then they generally will find the tolerance in their religion. Whereas if they view the, the game as zero-sum, in other words, uh, for them to, to win, then the other side has to lose. Um, and if they, and if they, they view the, the, the other group specifically as some kind of threat to their interests or to their values, then they're much more likely to find the belligerents um, in their religion. And uh, I, I, this is basically the way I interpret key parts of the history of the Abrahamic God. I use this to, to account for the emergence of monotheism and explain why I think when monotheism emerged, which I think is later than most people think, I think it's during the Babylonian exile of the uh, 6th century BCE, um, I, I argue that at that point uh, the God of the Israelites had a very belligerent character as a result of a kind of a zero-sum view of the world, but that after the exile uh, uh, there, there was a mood change because after that Israel was secure in the Persian Empire, its neighbors were no longer threats, they were fellow members of the empire, and so I conclude the contrary to what some people say, monotheism is not an, an, an intrinsically uh, intolerant and belligerent religion. And then I do similar things with the other, with the other faiths, follow the career of Muhammad, uh, talk about early Christianity through kind of the same uh, prism. Um, and uh, the, I guess the good news is I would say that all three religions, I think, are capable of adapting 
to circumstances in a way that moves them toward tolerance and away from belligerence. And in fact, I argue, I argue that all three of them do it um, under circumstances that are kind of uh, comparable um, to, to, to modern circumstances in ways I could elaborate on uh, if anybody's interested. But um, that is, uh, you know, the book is about more than that. But I think that's, uh, you know, th th that's the part of it that's probably, it's most relevant to Washington kind of, the most relevant to contemporary political events. Um, and so maybe I'll stop there. All right. Um, well, thank you, Andres, and, and uh, thank you, Bob, uh, for saying such kind words about my book. I, I think, you know, we had people who've written books um, which says evolution exists and God doesn't. You have a Hitchens kind of person. And then you have people saying God exists and evolution doesn't. But I think you, you have found the middle way here, which is saying <laughs> evolution exists and God is actually evolving. So I don't, so, so explain a little bit uh, you don't imagine there's a sort of a primeval monkey god who's become a human god. Explain a little bit. You start to explain, but when you talk about God evolving, yeah. what is it that you mean by that? Yeah. Um, I mean, first of all, there are, there are two kinds of evolution. There's the biological evolution that led to the human nature that gave birth to gods. And that discussion I actually confined to an appendix that was going to be a chapter initially. But the, the question of does human nature predispose us to religious belief, and in what sense, and how did religious belief get off the ground? Because after all, as far as we can tell, every, you know, 20,000 years ago when the world was full of hunter-gatherer societies, every single one had religion and believed in more than one god, so it, it, it seems to be a pretty universal thing. So that's one kind of evolution. The kind of evolution most of the book is concerned about is so-called cultural evolution. That is the way ideas, and technologies, whatever, kind of any non-genetic form of information uh, changes over time as people transmit it to one another. And I'm looking at this, the case of, of gods. Um, and and uh, I guess as far as where, where I am kind of theologically, I mean, I can't decide if it's good news, you know, what you said, that whether I, you know, the, the, from a marketing point of view, <laughs> the unfortunate way to look at the book is that it's, it antagonizes Christians, Jews, Muslims, and atheists, mm -hmm. whereas most books can only do Buddhists three of those. I think the Buddhists would like it. I mean, the Buddhists, the Buddhists there's a lot of Buddhism that's, that's the, that comes across. The, I, I and the very animists, few, I the, early, very few, yes. the hunter-gatherers yes. would like it. Hindus, there's a, it's just a, being published in the wrong country, perhaps. But um, the, uh, Or is it the case that, I mean, there is something for them all to like, I guess. First of all, I don't dismiss the idea of the divine being a real thing. Um, and my account of religions, although I wind up not being an atheist, my account of religions will be to the liking of atheists because it's very kind of materialist and, and, uh, and skeptical of the claims to divine revolu revelation. So, but, but my view is, what is my view? Okay, um, I should say that, uh, you know, I talked about religions having made this adaptation uh, toward... Uh, tolerance. And I think in a way the engine of that is that, um, well, let me say specifically what they've all done well at least once, I think, is adapted to a period of multinational empire, which in the ancient world was as close as you could come to the modern globalized world. So you had a bunch of different nations and they had what I would call a non-zero-sum relationship to one another. That is to say, it wasn't just win-lose. They could, two nations could benefit by trading or they could come together as allies in time of war and help each other. So you had potentially win-win situations, non-zero-sum situations, like the modern globalized world. And um, I argue that in those contexts, all three religions have shown their ability to kind of expand their moral compass to, uh, to, a, to, to the realm of empire. Even when, as in, for example, the Islamic Empire, this meant extending tolerance to a lot of uh, non non Muslims and, and freedom of worship to them, um, and uh, the larger argument that's part of we're, we're getting to this question of, of of whether why I think there's actually evidence of some sort of larger purpose unfolding in the world. Um, the larger dynamic behind that is that you know ever since hunter gatherer days. Um, social organization has tended to expand 
uh, on balance. You know, city-state, ancient state, empire. Now we have a globalized social system. And the system seems to be set up such that for the social system to survive uh, coherently and stay intact, there has to be mutual, some degree of mutual understanding and acceptance of people within that platform. Okay, there can't be war within it. Um, and in fact, to, to put that in a contemporary context, I would say that now we're at a period where, you know, given the strife in the world and how some of it falls along so-called civilizational lines, I would say either people in the world are going to get better at putting themselves in the shoes of people very different from themselves and acknowledging the humanity of people very different from themselves, or the, the system will be in peril, will be in danger of, of kind of collapse. And I think that's been the story, in a way, repeatedly all along. Um, and so, so in that sense, a kind of moral progress is necessary for social structure to keep expanding. Um, moral progress in the sense of people increasingly acknowledging the humanity of people diff of different nationalities, races, whatever. So I think th that would be what I would say is evidence that there's some there's enough directionality to, to the human experiment kind of to suggest some sort of larger purpose at work. Given the fact that there's a moral direction, that we seem to face the choice between kind of chaos and moving closer to moral truth, I would say, th that's, that's speculative evidence. It doesn't seal the case by any means, but evidence that there's some, in some sense some larger purpose unfolding. So I've gotten back around to what you're actually interested in, I guess. Um, maybe told you more than you want to know. Um, let, I'm going to back up. Let's back up to, I'm a Jew, so one of the things that interested me most in your book was your account of the development of the Jewish God, and notably the, the remarkable, to me, uh, your remarkable sort of uh, education of me, and the, the idea that the, the Jews were in no sense monotheistic at the beginning, and that the, the the evolution of Judaism as a religion, and then monotheism comes very much later, and is almost, and it's an accident that monotheism isn't doesn't seem to be a natural outcome of what Judaism was on a path towards, but it's an accident of a disaster. So, so talk about sort of the 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 way in which Judaism is a polytheistic or or sort of maybe not polytheistic, but but monolatrous religion that becomes a monotheistic religion, and why that's important. Yeah, um, I mean, actually, I know in your book you you kept noting that there was quite a bit more, because what you did is you took a close, you did a close reading of the Bible for the first time in your life and kind of first blogged and then wrote it. And, and you noted repeatedly, there's a lot more polytheism floating around than I had, than I had realized, right? Right, so, so one of the great discussions, that, so we, you have Yahweh as a god. Right. And for those of people, who's, who's read, have people read the Bible? Some people, a few? <laughs> okay, so you have Yahweh, and then you have this other god, El, sort yeah. of an El god. Yeah. And they don't seem to be the same God. And the El God seems to be connected to uh, yeah. the, panth the gods of Israel's yeah. enemies. Yes, although there, there's various evidence that El starts uh, figuring... I, I mean, one of the speculations is that Yahweh worshippers merged with El worshippers. There's all kinds of... Like, there's a, there's a strange verse in the, in the Bible where God says... Uh, my name is Yahweh, but that's not the name under which I presented myself to Abraham. I was called El Shaddai, and that's El with a, with a modifier. Um, so so that's, there's a lot of evidence that maybe El uh, maybe wasn't the original God of Israel. I mean, that Yahweh wasn't, and El was or something. In fact, the name Israel, the El in Israel, you know, that, that would be consistent with that um, hypothesis. But... Uh, in general, there's a lot of, um, yeah, the, I think scholars are moving toward the view increasingly that, poly, that monotheism comes late. The exile is, if you accept the conventional dating of texts, the exile uh, is, the, is the first time, the, the earliest prophetic text to unequivocally assert monotheism. Is, is so-called Second Isaiah, which is uh, the middle part of the book of Isaiah. Isaiah was written by more than one author, apparently, and the middle part is kind of thought of as, as Second Isaiah. And that seems to come during uh, the exile. Um, and 
you know, I, you're right. I, I view it as not, not, not an inexorable intellectual progression toward monotheism, but as a result of, poly, uh, of politics. Um, and I use it to, and really, although I think the, you know, the God after the exile turns out being a, a nice God, I do think it, it's, it's, it's growing intolerance of other gods and belligerence towards their people that leads Israel to monotheism in the first place. I mean, you, you, uh, if you go back to the, to the 10th century BCE, you have King Solomon. And the Bible acknowledges that he was a polytheist. And uh, the Bible does this a certain amount, but always attributes it to some like weird little quirk. But Solomon, it says, well, his foreign wives led him astray. They led him toward these foreign gods. But I think... There were 700 of them. There were 700 of them. So, you know, I mean, I think we may have a decimal point issue there. But even if there were only 70, that's a lot of wives. That that could lead him toward... uh, toward polytheism, but I, I, I think the, the thing about the wives and the gods really gets at the crux of my argument about what gives rise to tolerance and what gives rise to intolerance and how monotheism was born. The, the thing about foreign wives for an ancient king is that the reason he would marry them is as an extension of his foreign policy, to consolidate ties with another nation. Okay, And that's also the reason he would pay respect to the gods of a foreign country. So the deal is Solomon was just an internationalist. He just saw Israel as benefiting from relations with other nations. He had a non-zero-sum view of the world, I speculate. There's some, some evidence, but... So, Can I interrupt you there? Sure. Just because we're having a conversation. So, so this, to me, is a really powerful point in your book, is that this notion of internationalism means uh, incorporating the gods and beliefs of other cultures. Right. Doesn't, isn't that a, is a very, um, and, and when I read this, I thought, well, polytheism sounds great. Like, I, we should all be worshiping lots of different gods. And doesn't this, isn't this a very um, uh, tense argument for monotheists? If we're all, because we've moved towards all this monotheism, right. right? So now we have these great monotheistic religions. Uh, they're, not, they're not the only ones, obviously. You have, you know, uh, Hindu, you know, Hindu god, multiple gods and other religions. But the Abrahamic religions are all monotheistic. Isn't that failure to incorporate, modern failure to incorporate other gods into our belief system, isn't that a big problem for us? That we're going to, be, we'll be more intolerant now? Um, it may be a challenge. I mean, uh, I do argue that monotheism has adapted. It has managed to accommodate diversity in these various ways. Um, you know, there are arguments over to what extent it's, it's intrinsically kind of exclusivist. But, of course, the irony is that right now the tension is among people who all profess to worship the same God anyway. It, it's, it's, it's not intolerance of other gods per se that is the problem, which, which underscores, in a way, my largest point, which is just that the religious conflicts of the world are not about religion. And, you know, they, they are, they, they, they uh, and this is a little bit of a beef I have with the new atheists, by the way, is, is that they, they attribute, you know, they, they like to attribute all the problems in the world to, uh, to religion. So Richard Dawkins wrote in his book, if it weren't for religion, there would be no Israel-Palestine conflict. I, I think there would be. It's, it started out as a thing about land, and arguments about land, you know, kind of tend to go on until they're resolved. And if they weren't invoking religion, they'd be invoking uh, nationalism. But um, I... Uh, so, I, I mean, in a way, that's not the problem monotheism faces. The, to get back to, to the question, the, the, um, now, it's true that there are doctrines, I mean, they can point to doctrines that account for intolerance of one another, uh, of, of a sort. I mean, uh, Christians can say, well, well, they may say they're worshiping the same God, but we think you have to believe in Jesus, um, and, and, and so on. But... Uh, one thing you see is that there's been an incredible amount of uh, adaptability in the past, including, say, in the Quran. People don't realize when, when Muhammad thought he could bring the Christians and Jews on board, how many nice things he said about them and how far he went. Jesus is the word of God. Jesus is the spirit of God. He, 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 the one thing Muhammad couldn't say about Jesus is that he was the son of God because he had already told the Arab polytheists who worshipped daughters of Allah, that, that God couldn't have, that it was polytheism to worship offspring of God. So he couldn't go that far. But he went a long way. He said, you know, God chose the Israelites in his prescience as above all other people. Um, 
the uh, so um, you know I, I I think the what things are what what Abrahamics are pointing to as the reason for being exclusive toward one another I, I think are things that could dissolve under the right circumstances. Um, we'll, we'll talk about some of the circumstances in the past. So in the in the so you had for example in the Roman Empire, you have. Uh, you have a development of a Christianity which takes advantage of this global, this, this international empire and uses its, its diversity to, to build an international religion. Right. What are the circumstances today in which the different, these kind of cultural differences could be merged and, and Islam and Christianity and Judaism could be, uh, could cooperate? Um, yeah, it's... Uh well, there's two questions. What are the circumstances and how would they make the doctrinal adaptations? And like I said, the good news is there's some raw material in the scriptures for the doctrinal. Like the Quran says repeatedly that Jews and Christians are eligible for salvation. Something, yeah, I know. I, I was, I, I knew you'd be relieved. Um, it d doesn't do any good for me, but I, I'm, I'm happy for you. Um, the... Uh, um, Circumstances on the ground, you know, uh, I th well, I think Obama basically gets it, that, that job one is to make people feel that you are not a threat to their values, you're not a threat um, to, you, you know, that you respect them, that, that, that you don't want uh, to gain at their expense. I mean, I think the two, the two things he's done that I'd point to that are consistent with my view of what does change religion's attitude toward another religion are um, drawing a, a line in the sand on the settlements and, and, and saying we, ha you know, we have to be able to finally tell the Palestinians it's really stopped, you know. Um, and the, the, on the broader front, trying to convey respect to the, to the Muslim world. Um, I think those are, uh, I mean, you see you know, again, I mean, th those are, in, 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 in my take on the ancient world, that's, you know, the two, two things you see are fights about land and about respect. In those, when monotheism is emerging, and uh, in these first monotheistic uh, utterances, the earliest, so far as we can tell, in 2 Isaiah, um, you have these references to, uh, you know, nations that have humiliated uh, Israel. And, and even earlier than that, you know, I said Isaiah is the first monotheistic utterance. There are earlier prophets who are what's called monolatrous. That is to say, they insist on only worshiping Yahweh, even though they're not necessarily denying the existence of other gods. And there, in some of them, like Zephaniah, you see specific correlations between, you know, this nation has humiliated us. The Assyrians have been arrogant, and so on, and the refusal to worship that god. Uh, so, you know, disrespect, leading to religious intolerance goes all the way back. And so I think, I think Obama just, under, just gets it. Um, and, and he still has a huge challenge. But I think, um, you know, he's on the right track. Uh, you know, other things, I would say commercial engagement is a good thing. Um, uh, you know, so if the question is, do you withhold commercial engagement as a reward for religious moderation, or do you engage? I would say engage, um, because I think it tends to be moderating. Talk for a little bit about why, in, a, in the sort of God evolution perspective, Christianity uh, and Islam take off so successfully. What is it about their business model that <laughs> makes them? I mean, did you really do define I me? Mean, you talk about Paul as a, yeah. this creating Christianity. Not, I mean, that the Jesus of Christianity is not really. The, what Jesus actually is like, as described in the gospel, that Paul creates a whole separate vision of what Jesus is and creates a business plan to, yeah. to put that forward. So what, what's successful in, in Christianity and Islam that, that, that allowed them to, to work as yeah. businesses? Yeah, in the case of Christianity, I mean, you're right. I think that my view is that Jesus did not say a lot of the more laudable stuff attributed to him, the, the you know, universal love stuff, love your enemy, you know, the, ser the Sermon on the Mount is not found in the earliest gospel, Mark, the first one to have been written. Love your enemy isn't found in that. Um, and I argue that a lot of these, uh, although Paul didn't talk much about Jesus, 
he does profess and advance values that are later attributed to Jesus in the, in, in the later Gospels, um, especially. And I argue, and this again gets back to the idea that fundamentally religious grows out of religion grows out of material forces on the ground. I argue that these values of brotherly love and in particular transnational love, you know, Paul's famous line is neither Jew, we're neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither Jew nor Greek, all are one in Jesus. This transnational love grows out of his ambition to build an international network of churches. I think he was, felt divinely inspired. I don't think he was, you know, cynical about it. But I think once he decided that God's work was to create an international uh, network of churches, the rest kind of followed. I mean, if you look at when he is uh, emphasizing brotherly love uh, most famously in that chapter of 1 Corinthians that's read at weddings, you know, love is patient, love is kind, love isn't boastful, so on. He is, and scholars agree on this, what he's doing is he's writing back to a church, you know. One problem he had was like remote control because he would found a church and then he'd move on and he had to keep everyone in line. He's writing back to a church and that is rent by dissension and he's saying, you've got to love one another. That's what that is all about. You've got to love other people in the church and, and keep this thing together. And once you've got a network of churches, and I argue that one service he offered, the elites especially, who were important to him, he had to have these relatively affluent people providing their homes for, for, for worship services and so on. One thing he offered these relatively cosmopolitan people, these are the equivalent of people who fly business class today, was that they could now go to different cities and have a home. They would have a fellowship of, you know, of brothers they could plug into right away. So it was to some extent kind of a networking service. And once it was an international networking service, the love was intrinsically a transnational love. Now, I know that sounds, you know, this may be, sound cynical. I actually am heartened to think that the natural development of social organization, as it expands, tends to produce these doctrines of international uh, tolerance and affinity. And that's a large part of my argument that maybe there is some larger purpose unfolding. But, but yes, you're right. Um, what about Islam? Well, Islam's a little murkier. Um, the, uh, I mean, the fact is, Muhammad, uh, you know, he spends 10 years in Mecca. Uh, He's a very clear case of, of, the, uh, uh, of the, the belligerence or tolerance of his verses, uh, depending on whether he's in, in a zero-sum or non-zero-sum situation. Um, anyway, he spends 10 years as a, as a largely unrecognized, or, or at least not, not, not especially successful prophet in, in Mecca. He doesn't reach critical mass. Um, he, uh, he moves to Medina, and manages to secure political control of the city, and after that uh, expands uh, through military means, um, beginning with the conquest of Mecca, the very city that had, that had denied his, uh, his ambitions. Um, and, uh, the, uh, and, and he actually stopped short of empire. The imperial stuff comes after Muhammad. Uh, the... Um, and basically, it seems to be the case that in Medina, he works very hard to bring the Christians and Jews on board in many ways. Um, you know, I suspect the fact that Muslims don't eat pork dates back to this. Um, he even established, uh, apparently, Yom Kippur. Is, I've heard of two pronunciations. Kippur, Kippur? Yom no, Kippur. Kippur. Yeah. Um, thank you. The, uh, and, and calls it that. I, I mean, it, the, the Arab term that was then in use for Yom Kippur is the one that's used to describe what he has Muslims do. He prays toward Jerusalem. He has them pray toward Jerusalem, later changed to Mecca after he feels that, that the, the, the Jews just aren't going to come on board. And then he has this supposed break with the Jews. Although there's fascinating evidence, I don't know if you, you got to this, that, that actually maybe it didn't happen and that actually the, uh, the, conquest of Jeru the subsequent con conquest of Jerusalem after Muhammad's death was actually not Muslims but a combined force of Muslims and Jews. But, but anyway... Um, he, uh, he must have been charismatic. Uh, the, uh, he certainly, once he had control of, the, uh, of, of Medina, he, he uh, did a good job of inspiring people um, to stick together and to fight. Um, the, the so is Islam's growth a growth? A mil I mean, is, is, you, you describe Christianity as a growth in the way 
you know, kind of a network effect, a great network effect, and more like a business growth. Is Islam's right. growth a military growth, or does it have the same kind of element of f family? I mean, that, that's a question I think well, that disturbs people, is the notion that Islam I, fundamentally came out of a military background and grew because of military means. But maybe it. Maybe well, it, I think his, right. his establishing control of Medina involved transcending at least one existing kind of fissure, which was that between tribes. So he seems to exert a unifying effect that was not military in order to secure control of Medina. Um, but the, uh, no, the expand, I mean, the difference is Christianity, there was a pre-existing empire, and Christianity used that infrastructure. Um, with Islam, there, Islam created the empire, after Muhammad largely. Um, and, and this does account for, for the verses um, the so-called jihad verses in the Quran, although the doctrine of jihad does not, as a doctrine does not emerge until after the Quran, um, I will say that, uh, you know, on behalf of Muhammad, one, one thing he was not was some kind of crazy radical uh, who, who, who wanted to kill people for the sake of killing people. He was a very cool strategist. And you see this if you look closely at the verses that are uh, sometimes taken out of context. For example, this... Uh, the famous the so-called sword verse um, that is commonly translated as uh, kill the infidels wherever you find them. It's actually kill the polytheists, or in the Arab, Arabic it would have been kill those who join gods with God. Um, but if you look below and above it, there are all these qualifying verses. What, what, what the verse says is kill the polytheists wherever you find them. And you see that a lot of times on especially kind of right-wing right websites trying to show that you know, Islam is a religion of war. Um, but it's, it, below it and above it is nothing but qualification. And the qualification above it says, uh, basically, it, it, it talks about the declaration that, that he's about to make, this kill the infidel stuff. And it seems to say, you know, exempted are those polytheists with whom we are in league. And, and this is, um, you know, a lot, often it's, it's, things are a little murky, but this is certainly one it definitely has that phrase and says they're exempted, and it does seem to apply to what comes below. And one standard scholarly interpretation is that it does that. And the point is just that whenever you had these exhortations in the Quran to kill people, it was in the context of a specific war. And the point was, kill the enemy. We're going into war, kill the enemy. Um, in this case, it seems not to have been about religion per se. The enemy was polytheist. Um, but he expressly excludes those enemies who were, who were al I mean, those polytheists who were allies. So um, there definitely is, uh, um, you know, there are a fair amount of, of, of exhortations to violence in the Quran, although I think not as many as people think, and actually a more, possibly more common source of kind of retributive spirit in the Quran is when he's in Mecca and being persecuted and looking forward to how the infidels will suffer in the afterlife. That's, I would say, there's probably more of that, looking forward to the suffering of infidels, even as God is counseling him, Muhammad, not, not, not to mess with them. It, it, there's, in Mecca, and, and you see this again and again. I mean, I, I told you that in the Hebrew Bible, that when the Israelites say, hey, can't we get along? That seems to be a case where they thought they were going to lose the war. When Muhammad is outnumbered in Mecca, similarly, God is telling him, you know, let me take care of this in the afterlife. You do, it's not your job to fight these people. Um, but that is, uh, that's, I would say there's more of this retributive air that's not, doesn't involve the exhortation to violence than there is the exhortation to violence, which tends to be pretty carefully qualified when you look at it. All that said, I mean, I'd rather it weren't there. And I'd rather the bad stuff in the Bible weren't there uh, because, you know, Scripture is not without any impact at all. On the other hand, I, I, the, you know, people are very good at being selective in their readings when, uh, it's, when it's in their interest. The, uh, not to be self-involved here, but coming back to my Judaism. Uh, the, so which of these religions is not like the other? You have Islam is a great success. Uh, you know, billion people, it's over 1,500 years, grown explosively. Christianity, same thing. Why is Judaism such a failure? Failure? What, I yeah. thought you controlled the media. We do, but you know, what does that get us? The media is dying. Why, why, is this, why, is, why are these other forms of, of uh, 
of monotheism and these other you know models of ev the evolution of God yeah. effective in the modern world. And Judaism, I mean, you know, we don't yeah, get me wrong, not. we're in a good position. I'm happy about it, but um, but they're not many of us, and and they haven't. It as a religion, it hasn't had the same effectiveness. And I wonder huh. if we can learn from that failure in a way that we can learn from the the successes you cite for for Islamic um, Christianity. Let's see. Uh, I mean. In a way, you could say Judaism was spectacularly successful, and we call that variant of Judaism Christianity. Um, I, I don't, I mean, certainly Jesus we thought don't. of himself as a Jew. We, I know you don't. <laughs> um, but, uh, I, I mean, the, I think Paul thought of himself as a Jew. Um, the, there was, I mean, the, 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 the key moment comes when there's this argument among Jesus' followers in Paul's day. And some of them uh, want to insist that any converts to the Jesus movement undergo, they stick to the dietary restrictions of Judaism, and they undergo circumcision, okay, as adults, without modern anesthesia. And Paul, wisely, <laughs> you know, sees that this would be a disincentive. Um, and, in fact, and in fact, for some, uh, for some centuries, the, 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 the people who held the alternative view um, we would call them Jews for Jesus today or something, but we call them Ebionites. There was a group who, were, they were followers of Jesus, but they held to, the, to all of the, they followed uh, the Torah rigorously, which I think Paul himself did. And that's why I say I think Paul himself thought of himself as a Jew who was also now uh, welcoming new kind of people into the, uh, the group. But, but I think that's a certain amount of the answer. You know, a few decisions, do you, you know, on things like that, intermarriage, um, uh, Judaism, for the most part, has chosen not to be a proselytizing religion. Um, and uh, I don't know if it's a failure. It, it, I mean, if your goal is to maximize numbers, it's a failure. But uh, I think, you know, Paul was clearly looking for numbers, and he made the right decisions. Um, and, uh, and I think Christianity is really much more of a proselytizing religion than Islam as well in, 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 in most places. Um, and it's a little bit of an issue in Africa. Um, we have a fellow at the New America Foundation, Eliza Griswold, who's, who's working on a book on, that covers that. And I know that um, Christian missionaries, in her account, uh, sometimes incur a certain amount of wrath by how assertively they try, they, they insist to Muslims that they're on the wrong path. Um, I just want to cover one more subject, and then we'll have a couple of quick questions. Um, so if you look at, at the global economy today, the two you know, great new engines of growth, India and China, you have a, in China, I'm not really sure how you would characterize China religiously, but not as a, certainly not a monotheistic no. culture. In India, you have mostly sort of a polytheistic culture. Is the, is the, in the case of India, let's say, is that polytheism allowing do you think that has anything to do with the success of the Indian diaspora and the ability of, of Indian uh, businesses to, to move into lots of different places? Because they're accommodating of other religious beliefs without... I mean, I've I, I just made this up. I have no idea if there's anything to this. But Yeah. Um, in a way that... In a way that uh, I haven't thought of that. Um, and, and I think... I mean, I would also say, I think a lot of uh, modern, well-educated Indians might not characterize themselves as fundamentally polytheistic. There is this thing, this Vedantic tradition in the more modern part of Hinduism, which I'm not an expert, but as I understand it, it involves, among other things, the belief that all gods are one. And, you know, you, you asked uh, earlier, we were talking about what adaptations would be necessary for the Abrahamic religions to get along. One, at the theological level, uh, one thing you can imagine is this notion of the Godhead, which, which, uh, which is big in, in, in some parts of India and in some, some segments of Hinduism, which is that all gods are manifestations of the underlying divine unity. You call them by different names. And I actually argue in the book that after the exile, when, when Israel, Israelite monotheism is at its most inclusive, there's some language that suggests that that's what they were getting at. There is a strange fact that, that the term for God in, in the Hebrew Bible, the well, term that's commonly used is Elohim, which is a plural for reasons no one can right. figure out. It's a plural of yeah, the generic noun for God. I was hoping you explain that, and you didn't. Well, there is the, the speculative suggestion that it was 
it was especially, it seems to have been used before the exile, but after the exile, when Israel is a secure member of the Persian Empire, and Cyrus himself, who's whose influence on Israelite theology maybe we shouldn't overlook. The, the ruler of the empire would have had an in, interest in keeping the empire coherent. Um, uh, you know, he would have liked the idea that all these gods, all these different gods in the empire are really one, one god. And, and I, I, you know, one suggestion made not, not by me, I mean I'm citing other scholars, is, uh, is that Elohim reflects an attempt to give the, the idea of God, a little more of an international kind of diffuseness or something. But um, that was a tangent. What was it a tangent from? Do you remember? Indians. Indians. <laughs> uh, I, I just don't know. I do think uh, many of these, the well-educated Indians would probably not describe themselves as polytheists. They, they, they would probably say they're Vedantists and, and um, all is one. As for China, um, in China, there's, what, there's something a little different, which is a very... Um, w Buddhism ha has often been a, just a not at all exclusivist religion. So in China, you would have people say, I'm both a Buddhist and a Taoist. That, I would think, is an attitude that's very conducive to moving around in the world without having any issues. Um, but, you know, also, again, to get back to kind of my core theme, I think <clears throat> Christians, Jews, whoever, if they go to another country and they have a business opportunity... They're going to find they don't have problems with the local religion, you know. I really think, you know, th my hope lies in a somewhat cynical view of human nature, and that's that's what I think underlies the the, the malleability of religious doctrine. Um, well, that's great. Let's uh, have a couple of questions, and I think there's a microphone which is coming on up. So, in the front row, right here. Uh, my name is Chris Tennant, and. Uh, give you a little bit of background about who I am so you know where I'm coming from. I work mostly in the Middle East. I'm very uh, much concerned with the Palestinian Israeli situation and with all the problems that are associated with it. My question to you, now hearing what you say, talking about transnationalism and essentially the, the Abrahamic religions, the three religions, they are all people of the book as the Muslims would say. Now, Israel, as we know in the last couple of days, uh, has taken with this, you must recognize this as a Jewish state. This is, I think, really explosive. And why is it necessary for Israel to officially proclaim itself as a Jewish state? It has non-Jews in the state. This creates a real problem internationally, in my opinion. And I think it's really causing considerable problems for the Palestinians because they say the Palestinians are not cooperating. What do you make of that, Bob? Well, I think, um, yeah, Netanyahu, I think he has not, I think his government has said this is not a precondition for talks, but he's saying there cannot be a deal in the end until Palestinians acknowledge that Israel is a Jewish state. And I think what that's largely about is fear of this right of return issue which is that if enough Palestinians um, say, wait a second, this was our land in, in, in the 1940s, uh, aren't we entitled to it, that Israel would be dispossessed of considerable quantities of land and, and might even wind up with a Jewish minority. So I think that's the fear underlying their emphasis on recognition uh, as a Jewish state. My own view is that as a practical matter, this, this issue should be finessed until the end and maybe this is when my cynicism comes in handy again, I've got to think that there is some amount of material compensation in lieu of actual land that would keep the number of Palestinians who actually wound up living, moving to Israel pretty small. I mean, I think it's so overwhelmingly in the interest of the world to get this thing solved that I think you would have no trouble building up a pretty big fund to compensate Palestinians who, who chose not to, to take the land. So anyway, I think pretty mainstream view that I agree with is this issue should be left until the end. And, 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 and as I understand it, the Israeli government is now saying that, that, uh, that Netanyahu is not insisting on this as a, pre, uh, as a prerequisite for talks. He did not say it. Somebody else in the government did. I read it in the paper today. Let's move on to the next question. Ma'am. Hi, I'm Cynthia Butler. I'm a lawyer. I do conflict resolution stuff with an NGO called Conflict Solutions International. Um, 
my question is isn't isn't it really true that there's there's a sort of a normative right and wrong or you know yes no um, feature to to each of these religions. So I mean, I don't know how you overcome the fact that the the <coughs> exclusive claims of rightness. For example, I mean, I think that the, the in the Jewish tradition, right? Didn't didn't God tell Moses, "I'm a jealous God, just worship me"? You know, there's one and Elijah long before I think it wasn't Elijah before Isaiah? Didn't he dismiss Baal and all the Baal worshippers and say, "Look, there's one right one and the other one's a mess." And you know, so I, and, and what wasn't there punitive aspects to the polytheism in Jew, Jewish tradition? It's such that when sure. I mean Solomon's adopting all these foreign wives and foreign idols and all that. That's what caused the exile, right? I mean, that's why David wasn't sent on exile. David was this great king, and his son, because he took in all these foreign wives, was punished, and there's strict admonitions against taking foreign wives because of the embrace of idolatry. So the notion of idolatry in one religion, isn't that an exclusive claim such that the other ones are deemed wrong? I mean, there's a normative yes, no, right, wrong there in this, in a sense, isn't there? Yeah, I mean, as for the historical things, um, I mean, the Exile happens way, way after Solomon. And, and Elijah, I mean, that's a story about Elijah. We don't really know the dating. Of, we don't know if that story happened. That's not a text by Elijah. But um, the, uh, in the modern world, I mean, I mean yeah, yes, there are these, uh, you do get these um, in, in, the, uh, in, the, in the seemingly reliable historical accounts in the Bible, you absolutely get these bursts of intolerance. And finally, they... They uh, they kind of reach critical mass and lead them toward monotheism, I think, and and uh, and I pay a lot of attention to King Josiah, who I think is basically doing it to secure political control. But yes, you see this um, in the Bible. But you know, as a practical matter, now uh, I don't think Jews have a problem with other people worshiping. They're not out to to, to convert them anyway. I, I don't I don't. I mean, it's kind of another example, I think, of how things in Scripture can be rendered irrelevant by people's contemporary attitudes toward other people, right? Um, it's true that in, in history, there, there, you know, in the ancient history, there was a lot of intolerance. Um, am I wrong? I, I mean, are you, do you want Wait, to convert, do you want, are, are, you, are you intolerant of my, uh, well, lack, I, think lack the, of, I think the question is, I think it's a, the questioner is raising a broader issue, which is if, in the, if, you know, you can only worship one God in Judaism, right. and it's the God is named Yahweh, and you can only worship one God in Christianity, and that God right. is named God. What is God named? We, God. We call him God. God. Okay, that's a good name. <laughs> and then, uh, and if you can only worship one God in Islam, and that God is Allah, do, how do you? You can say there are ways that we can kind of get nudge these things closer together, but fundamentally, they're these are completely separate truth claims. And how do you? Well, the, how, do you, the, how do you ever get them the identity reconcile? of the God? Is I mean, not Jews. I think I think it works for Jews because we as we're we are separatist. You know, we've sort of said, well, we'll just you know live in these societies and not worry about the rest of you. But if you're these these cultures are butting up against each other, you can pick one or the other. But can you? How do you get well, to both together? Well, I don't know that. But, but the idea. The, I don't know if that's the, the conflicting. Yeah. But the conflicting claim, I don't think, lies in their having different. Gods necessarily. I mean, Allah is the term that Christian Arabs use for God. It just means God. Uh, and, and one thing I try to show is that from the beginning, I think the standard account is wrong, that, that there was this God called Allah and Muhammad came along and said, maybe that's the same God that Christians and Jews worship. I, I, I think this was the Christian, the, the, the God that Christians and Jews worshipped. And it, and was already recognized in Mecca. It's just that people were worshiping other gods. But that, that's an historical tangent. I, I, I don't think, um, you know, so first of all, you can argue that it's the same god. It seems to, in, in many ways, it is the case that each successive religion after Judaism was looking back at that god and saying that's the god we're talking about. That's what the Christians were doing, and that's what the Muslims were doing. That's what Muhammad was definitely doing. So I don't see um, a, an intrinsic conflict there. I think th the conflicts come from other doctrines. As I said, like Christians, A, being proselytizing and want to con wanting to convert everybody, and B, thinking it's not just you've got to believe in this God, you've got to believe Jesus was the Son of God. Now, you've seen some auspicious 
adaptations in that regard. The Second Vatican, as I understand it, says leaves open the prospect of salvation for people who do not believe that, that Jesus was the Son of God. Those are the kinds of things you would hope to see as modernization brings cosmopolitan values to people who have an interest in getting along with one another. Um, maybe I've still missed your, your point, or, or maybe you, you can... Well, uh, actually, one... You know what, let's go okay. to one... We'll okay. have one last question. In the, sir, in the back. Then I'll argue with you a little bit. Okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> do you uh, make any predictions about the evolution of organized religion? And... Um, I'm wondering if you see a sort of continued competition or peaceful coexistence amongst organized religions, as the previous questioner alluded to, their sort of zero-sum claims to truth. Um, or sort of like globalization, where you see a, a, a collapsing of national boundaries and a blurring of, of culture and country, might there be uh, a collapsing of organized religions into some institutionalized religious movement um, that, again, draws from different traditions, a kind of Dewey and common faith of sorts? Well, I, I don't, I mean, I don't know. It is interesting that there are, <clears throat> there are two different challenges going on. There's, you know, can the religions get along with one another? And then there, are, there is, for, especially for well-educated people, the challenge of reconciling religion to a scientific worldview. Um, and I think in a way, maybe both of those are at least implicit in, in your question. And, and right now, I, I think things don't be moving toward a single unified answer um, because you have on the one hand some, a lot of well-educated people adapting religion to, to kind of modernity and uh, thinking of God in a much more abstract, less anthropomorphic way or moving towards some kind of secular Buddhism or whatever, but the great mass uh, of believers, I would say many of them are, if anything, moving in the opposite direction toward the traditional and the fundamentalist. You know, one of the fastest growing religions is Pentecostalism. Um, and uh, I guess the relationship between the two is that, you know, modernity is leading kind of well-educated people to try to do this adaptation, and modernity is also viewed as threatening by a lot of other people who, for that reason, move back toward, if anything, a more fundamentalist view. So I'm not, I mean, I'm just not seeing one answer emerging right now, and I, I don't know. I mean, all we need is for people to tolerate each other. I'd settle for that. That seems to me doable. I, I, doubt, I doubt you'll wind up with a unified answer to that question, I mean, the, the more I think about it. Um, Absent alien invasion. Absent alien invasion, which will, Bob's which great, will bring Bob's us all... great hope for everything is that there will be an alien invasion and we'll all be one. Yeah, there was an episode world. of uh, The Outer Limits when I was young, and it's, it's left its imprint on me, yes. Um, thank you all so much for coming. I think we're going to wrap up here. Thank you, thank you Bob. Thank you. The book is great. <laughs>